Nationalism uh, speaker series. I just want to remind people that we have two more weeks. Next Monday, May 3rd, we have um, a presentation by Leslie Square, who's actually visiting in Boston already. She'll be speaking next week on iconic architecture and globalization. I can't remember the titles. And then the final week, um, May 10th, Professor Bruce, Bruce Mosleach will be presenting um, a paper on the local and the global in Jerusalem, kind of moving up the scale from neighborhoods, cities, nations, uh, with a detour to identities today, and then up to the global. Um, this evening, we are very pleased to have Professor Jonathan Glover as our main speaker. Professor Glover is a political philosopher and a professor of ethics at King's College, University of London, and he also serves as the director of the Center for Medical Law and Ethics. Dr. Glover is the author of several books on ethics, including Causing Death and Saving Lives, and a very highly cited and known book in this country, I'm sure in England as well, an investigation of atrocities committed by various regimes in, in this century. It focuses on Nazi, Nazi regime, on uh, Stalinism, on Vietnam, a variety of experiences in a book titled Humanity and Moral History of the 20th Century. Um, in that book, he used ethics to pose questions to history, and he advocates a use of history to give a picture of the parts of human potentiality which are relevant to ethics. And I also wanted to mention in the conclusion of that book, he underscored the importance of moral imagination involving both emotions and intellect as a basis for enabling creative human responses in a way to rival those which are deadened by distance, tribalism, or ideology. So we really look forward to seeing the extension of these or other new ideas in your presentation today, um, the title of which is Identity and National Conflict. After Professor Glover finishes, as is our custom, we'll have a commentary. And we're pleased to have Dr. Nadim Rouhana as our commentator today. Um, Dr. Rouhana is a visiting associate professor of international diplomacy at Fletcher down the road at Tufts University, taught sociology at Tel Aviv <coughs> University, um, and, has in, and has taught in the graduate program in dispute resolution at the University of Massachusetts, Boston for an extended period. He also co-chairs a seminar on international conflict analysis and resolution at Harvard. And his publications include Palestinian citizens in an ethnic Jewish state, identities in conflict. He's also the author of several articles on citizenship, democracy, and intergroup conflict in, in volumes and journals, including the applied Journal of Applied Social Psychology. So I think there's an overlap of interest in my two speakers today, and I'm really looking forward to how that Dan, thank you very much for that generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this extremely interesting series. Uh, I've said privately to Diane that when I saw the stuff about the series, I felt hugely disqualified, really. Uh, as I'm no kind of architect, I've never been to Jerusalem, I know little about the social sciences, um, but I was hugely flattered to be asked, and even though I felt that in a way I would be more appropriate as someone sitting in the audience, and I asked if I could be sent the readings for some of the other weeks, because it all sounded, all the other sessions sounded so interesting. I want to talk a bit about, uh, to start just briefly mentioning a few things about cities and conflict. And then I want to talk more about conflict and its psychology. And then at the end I'll try and get back a bit to cities. Um, I think one of the things which is rather striking about cities is that from the time of Homer until the 20th century, Cities were, on the whole, places of security from external attack. I mean, even in the siege of Troy, which Homer talks about, um, there was still a sense that you escaped from the battles outside into the city of Troy. When Hector was defeated at an early stage in um, single combat, he retreated inside the city of Troy, uh, where he was safe from enemy attack. And 
in Sophocles' play, he gives to Creon, who's arguing against Antigone, that you should put, the, put patriotism, put the city-state before personal or religious commitments, uh, Creon argues that the safety of the city is really the foundation of all other values. In the Fagel's translation, he says, Creon says, I could never stand by silent watching destruction march against our city, putting safety to rout. Nor could I ever make that man a friend of mine who menaces our country. Remember this, our country, our city is our safety. Only while she voyages true on course can we establish friendships truer than blood itself. Such are my standards, they make our city great. The city was a place of refuge which had to be defended because everything else depended upon the safety of the city. And this idea of the city as a place of safety has had a recurrence throughout Western thinking. Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, at the end of the 19th century, put forward a theory that it was one of the great turning points in human history when human beings who had lived in the wild as hunters moved into communities where they had cities and as a result he thought this was the origin of morality because the aggressive instincts that had been deployed against enemies outside were no longer needed within the safety of a city most of the time and as a result these, this aggression was turned inwards giving rise to morality, feelings of guilt, and so on. Now, I think this has hugely changed in the 20th century. In the 20th century, it's become commonplace for cities to be targets in war. There's been the 20th century collapse of restraints on targeting civilians. There was the um, blitz which Hitler launched on London, there was, in retaliation, the so-called area bombing of the German cities in the Second World War, where at the beginning the intention was only to target military targets in cities, but because of the inaccuracy of the targeting, they had a choice of either really going ahead and just targeting the civilians or giving up the project altogether. And before the uh, Normandy invasion, the only way they could convince the Soviet Union that they were serious about the war against Hitler was to keep up the bombing, or that's at least what they believed. I myself believe that the so-called area bombing of German cities was a war crime, deliberately targeting civilians in the way that it was carried out. But this, in turn, was the example cited by General Curtis LeMay of the United States Air Force when he did the firebombing of Japanese cities, and the firebombing, in turn, was cited as a precedent when they decided to drop the atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So cities are now targets, and the civilians who live within them are no longer safe in war in a way they were before. It's not just high-tech warfare bombing of the kind I've been describing. It's also, for instance, the there are very powerful descriptions of the attack on Leningrad, the, the, siege on, the siege of Leningrad by the Nazi forces in the Second World War, and how the whole population of Leningrad was mobilized against the Nazis, uh, although they were living under terrible conditions of freezing cold and st virtual starvation. Um, now, more recently, the city is, I think, not just a convenient target for people who can use weapons of mass destruction like atomic bombs um, and uh, the Second World War type bombing, the city is now, I think, often a symbolic target. I think it wasn't just, I mean, if one thinks of 9-11, it wasn't just that New York was targeted because there were a lot of people who could be killed, though no doubt that was part of it. I think it was also seen as a kind of symbol the World Trade Center symbol of American and international capitalism, uh, the city of New York, in a way, the quintessential image of America in the world outside. And again, I think the recent attack on Madrid. Um, Mario Vargas Llosa uh, wrote a very interesting newspaper article a few days after the uh, terrible terrorist attack on Madrid, in which he said this. He said, Madrid's modernity is the, in the me mental cosmopolitanism of its people, who, like the people of London, Paris, or New York, have become citizens of the world. 
Without leaving the historic center of the town, the capital of Spain is a microcosm harboring the landscapes and cultures of half the planet. It has been this free spirit, this unblinkered mentality of an open city, hospitable and democratic, that the fanatics sought to destroy. And he goes on to talk about the 200 dead, 1,500 wounded, and like 9-11, but on a smaller scale, the people, were of, the people killed and wounded were of 12 different nationalities. And he goes on to say, the killers were not mistaken in their target. Today's Madrid represents precisely the negation of the radical inhumanity of the exclusive tribal spirit of fundamentalism, religious or political, which hates mixture, diversity, tolerance and liberty. And I have to say, as a citizen of London, uh, I am acutely aware of this reason for targeting international cities. And given the recent role played against the wishes of most of the people in my country, uh, but the, t the war that Tony Blair took us into in support of President Bush, it would not be surprising if London is another target, I think, uh, for the same kind of treatment that Madrid got. Now, what I want to do, having talked a bit about how cities are symbolic targets, I want to talk a bit about the psychology of the kind of conflicts that make the, in, in which cities figure as targets. I think we increasingly see that the old-fashioned Marxist view that the primary motivation of human conflict was economic is much too crude and simple as an account of what's going on. I think the, in a way the deeper so, obviously there are often conflicts which are linked to economic matters. Um, I mean, no doubt the Middle Eastern crisis is partly fueled by conflict over things like water supplies, conflict over um, access to ports and so on. But I think the deep psychology of much of modern conflict in the modern world is either tribalism, either a kind of deep feeling that we belong, there's us and them, we belong to our tribe and they are in our country occupying it or attacking it or trying to undermine our rights or whatever it is, or alternatively belief, differences of ideology, sometimes, sometimes political, as for instance in the Cold War, uh, but sometimes religious, as in the conflict between, um, to take two extremes, Christian fundamentalists in this country and Islamic fundamentalists in the, in the Middle East. I want to talk today about tribal conflict. I mean, there's a whole interesting topic of conflicts of belief, which I'd love to have time to talk about, but I want to home in on tribal conflict today. And I want to start by suggesting that there is some evidence that human beings have a troubling disposition to join up in groups and feel hostility to rival groups, even when there's absolutely no basis for group membership. I'm talking, I'm going to talk particularly, as many of you may know this already, there's a powerful social psychology experiment uh, carried out many years ago by Philip Zimbardo and his colleagues, in which he took college students and they were asked to take part in a psychology experiment on role-playing. And half of them were to be prisoners in jail, and half of them were to be prison warders, prison officials, prison guards. And the students were assigned to one group or the other randomly, and they all knew they were assigned randomly. I don't know exactly how he did it, but it was as though he got them to line up in a row and he'd say, guard, prisoner, guard, prisoner, guard, prisoner. They knew that they had been assigned randomly. But after a few days, Zimbardo was forced to stop the experiment because of the appalling brutality with which the people who were role-playing prison guards treated the people who were prisoners. And already, feelings of hostility, animosity had developed between the two groups, which manifested themselves in this, although they knew there was no basis whatever for it. I have a trivial anecdote to illustrate the uh, way in which hostilities can uh, get together, can be set up, without there being any real basis. Some years ago, I lived in a road in London called Regent's Park Road, and there was a road just next to it called Gloucester Avenue. And it used to be that the traffic went down both these streets. 
and the local council decided it would be a good idea to shut off the traffic from Gloucester Avenue so that that would be a peaceful, quiet road, with the result that all the traffic went down Regent's Park Road. And you can imagine that the Gloucester Avenue people all supported the scheme, and the people in my street, Regent's Park Road, all opposed it. But I was very struck that when I went to one of the meetings where we were trying to argue against this scheme, um, and a fellow resident of Regent's Park Road said to me, talking about something the Gloucester Avenue people had just done, said, isn't that just typical of those Gloucester Avenue people? And what is so absolutely fantastic is, of course, these identical roads. You know, it's total luck that some of us happen to be in one street and some of us happen to be in the other. And yet already there was this feeling that, of course, the people in that other street are absolutely terrible. So what I'm trying to suggest is that part of the psychology of conflict is there seems to be this really troubling disposition simply to take sides, even when there's absolutely no historical, ethnic, religious, ideological basis for doing so. And indeed, some sociobiologists have speculated that there may be roots in the type of life that people lived in the Stone Age when it's said that our genotype roughly stopped evolving, which might even suggest that there could be a, a genetic disposition towards this kind of hostility. But of course, most hostility isn't actually between randomly chosen groups. Uh, most hostility is between... Uh, groups which are either national groups or religious groups or ethnic groups of some sort. And I think one of the striking things which I'm always struck by anyway in the uh, social science and historical discussion of nationalism is how extraordinarily recent many of the European nation states are. Um, people like Ernest Gellner, Benedict Anderson have suggested that it's very much a feature of the post-medieval world that these nation-states exist. And let me just take one striking example, the case of Germany. Because one of the things that always strikes me as extraordinary about the Nazis is that the Nazis, being social Darwinists and desperately concerned to tidy up the gene pool so that they would win in the evolutionary struggle by having better genes than the people in the other group, they were concerned that the German race should triumph in the struggle for survival. But what is so absolutely extraordinary is that Germany only existed as a state uh, from the late 19th century. So if the Nazis had gone back a hundred years before, it would have been the deeply biologically rooted struggle for survival between Prussia and Bavaria, or some other countries like that. I mean, the way in which nation states are actually social artifacts rather than, as it were, deeply biologically rooted is something which I think is central to understanding the psychology of nationalism. Benedict Anderson has this wonderful phrase, imagined communities because we think that we have things in common with our group, even though, I mean, I live in, a, uh, in Britain, which has a population of about 60 million, and I've only met a tiny fraction of them. And the idea that I feel there's some essence of Britishness that we all possess, if I feel that, it must be. I don't actually, but if I, if I did feel it, it must actually be some kind of social construction, some kind of imagined community. I think that the deep phenomenon isn't really the nation-state, but rather tribalism, the way in which human beings do fall into groups and do have this idea that there's us with our set of characteristics and them with a different and, as we normally think, inferior set of characteristics. And let me just mention the, 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 uh, one I illustration of the kind of myth that fuels this tribalism. I was once talking to a student uh, from Belfast in Northern Ireland. And I actually can't remember now from which of the two communities there she, she came. I can't remember whether she was um, a Catholic or Nationalist or Protestant or Unionist. Um, but she was in one of the communities and she said that she told me that when they go to college there, when they go to university, where they start mixing for the first time, they deliberately don't say their last name, because the last name is a complete giveaway, usually, about which community you're in. They want to make friends across the community barriers. The first names are sometimes giveaways, but not so much. So they don't give their, their last names. They try and make friends, and they usually do. And when they've made friends, they then talk about the politics of the place, and they talk about the myths. And she said to me that for her it had been fascinating, because one of the things that in her community, they all believed, 
was that they, the, the, there isn't even a you know, genetic difference we're talking about. It's simply cultural and religious. Uh, they're all Irish. But um, the, they believe, the, in her community, they believed that whereas they had two separate eyebrows, people in the other community showed their primitiveness by just having one eyebrow that went all the way across. And this is a preposterous and absurd belief, particularly as they see each other in the street. You know, it's, as it were, empirically refuted every day. But that, talking about this to her friends in the other community, she found they had the identical belief about them. This eyebrow legend was projected by each community onto the other. This, I think, is a very striking example of the us and them uh, psychology. Now, I think one of the things is that the which is puzzling, I think, is that some well, groups, for, groups form on the basis of some kinds of characteristics rather than others. There are some characteristics which carry a distinct emotional charge. It's always very striking, for instance, to me that um, in w these long, tedious negotiations in the European Union about things like agricultural policy, um, the newspapers in my country, and I suspect in all the others too, most of the others too, the newspapers always report it as Britain defeating France or France defeating Britain. They never talk about farmers defeating consumers or consumers defeating farmers, although the negotiations are actually about that, and that might seem more relevant. But it's always reported because somehow in this way because being British or being French is important to people in their sense of identity in a way that being a farmer or being a consumer isn't. And it's certain features which I think give rise to, to this sense of being us and being different from them. Partly it's a matter of the territory you live in. Partly it's things like a particular ethnic appearance. Partly it's language. One sees, for instance, in Canada and in Belgium where people, in a, in a sense, in one country, are fairly deeply divided, often managing to make a go of it, as I think they are at the moment in Canada, but often fairly deeply divided by linguistic differences. Then again, there's religion, and then there's culture. And what I think I want to suggest is that there are reasons why it's this particular set of characteristics. Let me just give you one illustration of an utterance, a nationalist utterance. Um, the appalling former leader of Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, started the terrible civil wars in what used to be Yugoslavia in the 1990s uh, by his visit in 1987 to Kosovo. And in Kosovo, it's, there's a huge Albanian majority the Serbian minority, however, uh, are, feel very strongly Serbian, and Kosovo also happens to be the site of many of the great religious and historical sites that are very important in the history of the Serbs. So it's a, it's a powder keg as far as conflict goes. And Milosevic went and gave a speech to the Serbs there, an aggressive speech urging them towards conflict with the Albanian majority. And th this is a quote from what he said. He said, you should stay here. This is your land. These are your houses, your meadows and gardens, your memories. You shouldn't abandon your land just because it's difficult to live, just because you're pressured by injustice and degradation. It was never part of the Serbian character to demobilize when it's time to fight. You should stay here or your ancestors will be defiled and your descendants disappointed. Now, I think that brings out, that speech brings out the way in which certain characteristics carry an emotional charge. Territory, for instance, your land, your houses, your meadows and gardens. But also the way in which that's linked to memories, to a shared history. He talks about your meadows and gardens, your memories. And then there's also the self-flattering account of the Serbian character. It was never part of the Serbian character to demobilize when it's time to fight. And then the reference to ancestors and descendants. Now, I believe that tribalism, this sense of national identity and its great importance and its devastating powers for 
fueling conflict. I believe this is linked to th something quite deep in us about our personal identity. I think tribal or national identity comes from our own need to create something coherent out of our lives. Most of us don't set out. I mean, John Rawls uh, has a wonderful idea where he talks about people having a life plan. Now, I think that that's an idealization, what some social scientists might call an ideal type. Uh, few of us actually sit down at the age of 20 and construct a life plan until we're 80. Most of us, it's a much more messy affair than that. Uh, I mean, I feel my life, to, since this is an architectural place, I feel my life is a bit more like a sort of sprawling um, kind of medieval higgledy-piggledy town than a planned garden city of the kind that uh, a 19th century town planner or early 20th century town planner might have brought up. But all the same, even if we don't have a life plan, most of us do have some idea that we want to create ourselves to some extent. We want to create our own identity. We want to be in charge of our lives. We have a conception of the sort of person we want to be and perhaps even more the sort of person we don't want to be. And this I think quite deeply important project in our identity involves some kind of narrative. We have a narrative story we tell about our own lives and that story is its like writing the novel of your own life. That story is bound up often with places so that when Milosevic says this is your, these are your houses, your meadows and gardens, that will strike a chord in people. It's also a story bound up with other people. The story of my life is bound up with my parents, my wife, my children, my grandchild, my friends, all sorts of people I've met who I've taught, um, they all play a part. And they, in a way, also confirm the public nature of the story. In fact, I can talk to them. I can say, do you remember when we did such and such? It shows that they, if they do remember, they don't always, because I often get it wrong, but if they, do, if they do remember, that confirms that it isn't just a, a fantasy about the past of mine. And relationships often draw on a shared cultural background. We need other people partly to confirm our own identity. I hope we're not so egoistic that we only have other people to confirm our own identity. We love them for their own sakes too. But we do need them to confirm our identity, our sense of our own identity. And those relationships draw on a shared cultural background, usually a shared language. And Self-creation brings with it the need for recognition. People want to be recognized for who they are and what they are. For the, and people want to be noticed as the, having be, to be this sort of person rather than that. And this recognition depends on other people uh, in our culture who understand what we're talking about, speak our language, who we have all sorts of shared things we can presuppose so we don't, don't have to spell it out. So any lack of respect for that culture and language is in turn a threat to the value of the recognition we receive. So in that way the national narrative is I think parallel to a personal narrative and the national identity on which the, the, the cultural and national identity on which our own sense of our story, our personal story being validated depends, depends also upon a story constructed about what it is to be American, what it is to be Israeli or Palestinian, what it is to be English, and so on. And these narratives um, are often rather dangerous because on the whole, embarrassingly, uh, the narratives you often are narratives of conflict with other groups and often bring out how much better our own group is than the other group. There are narratives of victory, uh, for instance, the, and these are sometimes acted out in ways that fuel conflicts. In Northern Ireland, uh, there's what's called the marching season, where people go on, the Protestants go on parades where they march through Catholic areas celebrating the victory of the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 or whenever it was um, over, the, over the then Catholic people there. And this is a, t taken as a, a deliberate humiliation by the Catholics who live in this area as these Orangemen march through beating their drums and celebrating the victory over the people who are living in the houses and the streets they're marching through. 
Um, then again, there are narratives in Yugoslavia of the Serbs and the Croats. Uh, the Serbs were blamed for communism by the Croats because uh, Tito was a, a Serb and the Croats in turn were blamed for the fascist state when Croatia had been allied with Nazi Germany. But it doesn't just go back that far, it goes back all the way through various assassinations in the 1930s, goes right back to the Balkan Wars at the beginning of the 20th century. And I shouldn't be surprised if, if one went back then, one didn't find those Balkan Wars were fueled by narratives going back deep into the 19th century or even perhaps further. And as a result, you get these vendettas. And it's striking that part of the vendetta often involves the wish to obliterate the other side's version of the story. So that in Yugoslavia, for instance, when Serbia invaded Bosnia, they deliberately destroyed mosques, libraries, monuments. They wanted to obliterate all traces of the other, of the other culture, of the other story, the rival, the rival story to theirs. And the vendetta goes on. In the 1990s, many of the Serbian leaders were themselves the sons, the, the Serbian leaders who led the war against Croatia, for instance, the politicians and the generals, were in many cases sons of people who'd been victims of the fascists in Croatia in the Nazi period. So that General Mladic, for instance, now wanted for war crimes, uh, the Serbian general, his father was killed by the Croatian Ustashi. And General Adzic, uh, who had, as a child, had hidden in a tree while the Ustashi hacked his parents to death. Well, he was the person who planned the war on Croatia. And Milan Kovacevic, who ran a chain of Serbian concentration camps in the 1990s into which Croatian people were put, he himself was born in Jasinovac, which was a Croatian concentration camp for Serbs back in that period. And so you can see the, the spiral go on. And sometimes people involved in these conflicts have the wisdom to see that this is all one big trap. They're mutually entrapped by, by the, these stories. The Croatian writer Slavenka Trakulic, for instance, uh, writing in the 90s at the time of, these, uh, of those wars, said, I am afraid that as we have been forced to take sides in this war, we, all of us on both sides, will get caught in that cruel, self-perpetuating game forever. The theoretical account given of this uh, was, uh, was of nationalism as, the, this, as response to defeat was given by the German poet Schiller. Schiller uh, had what he called the bent twig account of nationalism. This has been popularized uh, in recent times by Isaiah Berlin, who's written essays on this. Schiller thought that nationalism is usually at its most intense when it's the response to a defeat or a humiliation. Uh, you know, the bent twig meaning, you know how when you walk through a wood with lots of trees, not trees which have only firm, solid branches which don't move, but those thin, young branches which as you push through, they, they bend before you. But it's not very nice to be the second person walking through the wood because the first person pushes the branch and it whips back and hits you if you're the second person. That's what Schiller meant by the, the bent twig. And it's very striking that German nationalism, if just to take that example, is, seems to me, hugely an illustration of Schiller's point. Because the great philosopher of German nationalism, Fichte, uh, he was the first theorist of German nationalism. Uh, he produced his theory, which published as a book called Addresses to the German People. Those addresses were given to the German people in Berlin in 1807, at a time when Germany, or that part of Germany, had been defeated by Napoleon, and Berlin was occupied by the French at the time he gave those lectures. And then again, fast-forwarding a bit in German history, there's one of the things which all seems to me so strange when one studies the Nazis is how much of the Nazi ideology was showed the Germans as victims. We tend not to think, because we remember what the Nazis did, we tend not to think of mid-20th century Germans as victims, but we 
I think, need some historical imagination. The Germans found it a deep humiliation when they were defeated in the First World War, many of them did, the humiliation of having to sign up to the war guilt clauses before peace would be made at the Treaty of Versailles uh, meant that the whole of Germany had to subscribe to the view and their leaders had to, on their behalf, accept that they took the whole responsibility for the origins of the First World War, which is, I think it's fair to say, a simplification at best. And reading Hitler, reading Mein Kampf, I misspent some of my middle age uh, reading, reading Mein Kampf, and I was struck by the extraordinary sense of resentment uh, at the, the humiliations and defeat. And this obviously wasn't just a personal resentment, because, I mean, he did actually manage to play on this sense of national defeat uh, to build up his nationalist movement. I mean, so people sometimes give an economic account of the rise of Hitler in terms of the, the slump and the inflation and so on. But I think what's very striking is that there were two radical movements in Germany each of which promised radical changes in the economic system, there were the Nazis and the Communists. And I suspect that the reason why the Nazis won out as against the Communists was because of the deep appeal of the nationalist component in the Nazi ideology, which wasn't there in the Communist ideology. Now, having sketched out in crude and schematic form something of what I take the psychology of nationalism to be, have we got the ability to free ourselves from the, the, the grip of, of these, at least these crude and dangerous forms of nationalism? I think there are some obvious political moves to make, uh, which I, mean, I think it's a matter. I, I don't know that we can totally escape from nationalism. It may be too deeply rooted in our psychology for any total escape to be possible. But I think there is the chance that we can at least mitigate its dangers and mitigate its grip on us. Um, partly it's a matter of political moves, partly it's a matter of uh, psychological things. Political moves, I think one of the things is that if there's a group who wants to be independent because they feel they're a we, different from the rest of a, a country, the way to avoid conflict, struggle and resentment is simply for the larger group to say yes. I think the very striking successful case of this recently was what used to be Czechoslovakia. The Czechs could have said, no, no, you've got to stay in, we will impose it on you. But the Czechs, in their civilized way, said, if you don't want to stay in the same country as us, let's have an amicable divorce. And so they did. Now, my own belief is that this is the way to avoid nationalist resentment. Um, I think, for instance, as an English person, I think that if the people of Scotland want to be fully independent, I would welcome that. I wouldn't stop being friends with Scottish people because there were two delegations at the United Nations instead of one. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to matter hugely. Then again, there's the idea of the soft-edged nation-state. We perhaps don't have to think of nation-states as being quite so rigidly separate from each other as we have done traditionally. We could think of them in a more porous way. For instance, in Northern Ireland, um, it seems to me so clear. Some of you may know the thing Wittgenstein um, uses in discussions of philosophy. He uses the psychological drawing known as the duck rabbit. There's a kind of cartoon which appears in some psychology textbooks of a drawing which you can read it one way as a duck and you can read it another way as a rabbit. And Wittgenstein's interested in the psychology of the switch of gestalt. Now, my feeling is that a place like Northern Ireland is a classic duck rabbit. One lot of people say, it's just part of Ireland and that's it. And another lot of people say, no, no, it's just part of the United Kingdom and that's it. Well, it seems to me what we've got is one lot of people saying it's a duck, one lot of people saying it's a rabbit, and if you try to be a little more objective, it starts to look a bit more like an ambiguous figure. And perhaps the political realities could reflect this a bit more. Already they're trying to do this as much as possible, uh, but there's still a long way to go, I believe. But already, for instance, if you live in Northern Ireland, you have a choice of passports. You could have an Irish passport or you could have a British passport. I don't see why there shouldn't be two flags flying, a British flag and an Irish flag, flying above the town hall in Belfast. It doesn't seem to me obvious that 
the boundaries between two nation states have to be so rigid that you're in one or in the other. And that, I think, might apply if we go just for a moment reverting to cities. Uh, possibly this would be some, this idea of the, uh, of the shared sovereignty would be something which could be applied to Jerusalem, for instance. Then again, there are the psychological moves uh, that we need to make. Um, one thing is, of course, we simply need to understand the psychology of nationalism and to be aware of how dangerous it is. I mean, when the two groups of students in Northern Ireland discovered that they each had this stereotype about the eyebrows, they learned something deep and important, which I hope will stay with them for the rest of their lives. It seems to me if we have that kind of understanding, um, we will be a little bit more sceptical when we're told by our own politicians that we are utterly in the right and the other group are the axis of evil or whatever it is, whatever denunciatory phrase is used. Um, then again, there's the possibility of acts of generosity across the boundary. Uh, for instance, the Israeli writer David Grossman talks about how one time when I think 12 people were killed in a terrorist attack by Hamas, um, a Palestinian friend of his called him up offering to donate blood. That kind of act must make a difference, especially if it's publicized, must make a difference to the, must at least complicate the crude, hostile story that's told about the other group in, 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 among the other side. Now let me just for a moment uh, say something about um, cities. As I said at the beginning, I have disqualifications for being here and talking about cities because I'm no architect, no town planner. I live in an international city, London, and love it. Um, I love Boston, I love New York, I love Paris, I love all sorts of cities, but I have no special expertise, so that what I'm going to say about cities is going to seem, I think, a little amateurish and crude, and you may even feel not entirely about cities. But the first thing is that Big international cities, by the way they act as magnets to draw in people from both sides of a conflict, can act as somewhere which gives people space for reconciliation. Uh, I want to just tell you a bit about an Israeli and a Palestinian who met in New York. I read an article recently by an Israeli writer called Dorit Rabinian, um, who went to New York as a young student and met a Palestinian artist called Hassan Hurani. And they had a relationship. Across the barriers, they had a, 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 a deep and uh, amorous relationship. And then sadly, Hassan went back and was drowned in an accident in Palestine. And after his death, she wrote a letter to him talking about their relationship and talking about how she felt about him and about the role of New York in bringing them together. She wrote, Neither the chicken soup in the Ashkenazi restaurants in the East Village nor the salab in the Cairo cafe assuaged our longing for home. I had to sit with a Palestinian guy on the freezing steps of the city hall in Brooklyn in order to admit to myself how attached I am to Israel. I had to go all the way to New York so that you, with the nostalgia of one born to a refugee family who grew up longing for the landscapes that surrounded me my whole life, would describe them to me. Far from them, by your side, I loved them more than ever. The expression on our faces was the same. The vista was of the same homeland. Only the passports in our pockets were different, the passports of enemies. And we knew that if we hadn't taken a 12-hour flight to a generous city like New York, we would never have met. I think this is a kind of unheralded, un unsung role of, of the big cities. I hope London does it too sometimes. Uh, of just simply by providing a huge place of variety, by providing a magnet. It means people from all over the world come and start to muddle along with each other in ways they might not have predicted in advance. Then there's also the way in which cities, by having large numbers of people, can make huge and impressive demonstrations of solidarity when they are attacked. 
uh, I mean, I remember being incredibly moved when I saw on television in Europe the pictures of New Yorkers after 9-11, the extraordinary bravery of the firemen, the extraordinary dignity of Mayor Giuliani, the flowers, the candles. These were public demonstrations of solidarity, of sympathy, of grief. And I think something similar happened in Spain. In Madrid, there was two minutes silence. And it was pouring with rain during the time that the two minutes silence was supposed to be. And they could have stayed indoors, had their two minutes silence indoors. But they had to be seen. They wanted to make a public demonstration. So they came and stood out in the rain, partly to show they weren't scared off the streets by the fear of terrorism, because who, at that stage nobody knew that there might not be more bombs somewhere. They were showing they weren't scared. They were showing their solidarity with each other. And there was a sea of hands holding up bits of paper simply with the word no. That's something which I think a city gives the scope for. You can do it in a village too, but it doesn't have the same impression as the huge mass of people coming together to show a united city of an enormous size. Now let me say something just brief, because I don't want to finish without saying anything about the Jerusalem project. Um, I think this idea that you've had at MIT is a terrific idea of thinking about Jerusalem as a, a city that might one day transcend and show the way to transcending the terrible conflicts. I think it's particularly courageous to put forward this idea at the moment because, as we all know, this is an extraordinarily dark time in the Middle East conflict. But I just have a couple of things to say about, the, uh, about, about Jerusalem. One is that I very much hope that in the plan for the, uh, for the, the new Jerusalem, if I can use the phrase, um, I hope that there will be joint schools for Palestinians and Israelis. It's one of the curses in Northern Ireland that Protestants and Catholics go to different schools. And this is accepted as a mark of religious tolerance. But the result is the eyebrow rubbish. They hate each other, they never meet each other. And there were appalling scenes about two or three years ago of young children of about five Catholic children going to some school, walking through a Protestant district and being jeered by adult Protestants who didn't want the, these Catholic scum walking through their district. And it's, it was a shaming and humiliating thing for anyone who is in the same country as uh, that group of people to see adults treating five and six year old children in that way because of this tribalism. And if there were shared schools, I think the problem would not be nearly so acute. Now this doesn't for a minute mean that we have to have any lack of respect for the differences of culture. Judaism and Islam are different religions and that's obviously not, the, not by any means the whole of it. They're whole different cultures. But I do think that shared schools, even if they sometimes separate to be taught their religions, though I rather hope that sometimes they'd invite each other in for the religious classes so they could hear the other point of view. Um, the other thing is I'd like to see a building now. This is really before the, the conflict ends because this is something to try and help the conflict. I'd like to see a building and preferably as dramatic as possible. I mean, I, having recently been to Bilbao and seen the amazing impact on that city of Frank Gehry's new Guggenheim Museum, I'd like to see a dramatic building to be designed and built by a mixture of Palestinians and Israelis. And the point of this building would be partly a celebration of kind of museum of both cultures, both religions, they might even be generous enough to include the third religion, Christianity, that has Jerusalem as so important in its story. But it would also be, it wouldn't just be a dead museum, it would have live projects going on to try to further the peace process. And let me just mention one of the projects that I, 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 I believe, I, well, I'll mention, mention a, a, a couple. One is, one of the most heartening things in the when the discussions in Northern Ireland leading up to the Good Friday Agreement were taking place, one of the most heartening things was that people came from other conflicts to try to give the lessons which could be learned from them to help the people in Northern Ireland. People came from South Africa. 
to say, look, we were in this terrible mess of conflict and somehow we've more or less transcended it. And you can learn about truth and reconciliation commissions. You can learn all sorts of things. And I thought that was terrific. One thing could be that the building I envisage, which really needs to be set up, as I say now, not in 20 years' time, because the conflict, you, you've got to end the conflict before the project, you've got to do something towards ending the conflict before the project the, uh, that you're talking about really can get going. Um, but I um, would like to see this happen now. A project where people, joint teams of Israelis and Jews, Israelis, uh, sorry, Israelis and Palestinians, Jews, I, I never know what to say because there are Palestinian Israelis. Uh, I, so I'm never quite sure what the right uh, terminology is. You know what I'm talking about. People from both sides could study other conflicts and see what they could learn from them. But the other thing is, I would like to see projects which would try to sh weaken the grip of this single-minded, relentless, one-sided tribal narrative. And so what I would like to see would be the project which would consist of this kind of thing. This is just an example. I'll try and show you the kind of thing I'd like to see. I'd like to get a group of Israelis and a group of Palestinians. And each side would have the job of making a film. They'd have the job of making a film of the history of their conflict. And the idea of making the film would be that the Israeli group would be asked to make a film stating as eloquently and powerfully as possible the Israeli case about how the, how the Isra telling the Israeli story about how the conflict has gone. They would be able to interview people who suffered from Nazi persecution. They would be able to interview people who had had their relations killed by suicide bombers, interview who you like, interview the politicians, everything to make as eloquent and powerful a statement of the Israeli case as possible. The only constraint being that you mustn't do the Goebbels type propaganda where you actually say things that aren't true. You, to, subject to the constraint of not knowingly saying things that are factually false, make the most powerful case you can. Then I'd want the Palestinians to do exactly the same about their side. Make the most powerful case you can. Bring in people who've been humiliated at the Israeli checkpoints. Bring in people who used to live in houses that are now occupied by Israelis. Bring in people who've known the refugee camps. Bring in people who've, whose houses have been bulldozed by the Israeli army. Make the most powerful and eloquent case you can. Then I'd want, in this building, I'd want them all to meet and show each other their two films. And then I'd want there to be a seminar on the possibility of historical objectivity. How far is it possible to be objective about history? And I'd want them to discuss whether, at least in theory, it would be possible to make a film of the kind that God might make, God or Allah uh, might make, about the, about, the, about the conflict. Now, I happen not to be a religious believer, so I'd happily substitute Tolstoy as our nearest, uh, 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 the, the nearest we can get to the God's eye view. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the question they were to discuss would be, is it possible, to, would it be possible to make a film that does, does justice to the points made in both the two films that have already been made? And the next thing would be to go to get them to work together and go away and make that film. Now, of course, that would be, if it worked, Oh, there is obviously so many ways in which such a project could come unstuck. But if it worked, that would educate, say, a couple of dozen people on each side, depending on how many were on the teams. I'd also want there to be a meta film being made by somebody else about the whole process, so that the whole world could learn from what was going on. This is the kind of project I'd like to see to weaken the grip of the tribal narrative. And this kind of educational project, I think, needs a building in Jerusalem now rather than waiting. I'm sorry, I've gone on rather a long time, but thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, to uh, respond and uh, discuss to a fascinating, fascinating uh, presentation. I have, uh, I think, uh, a number of uh, disadvantages here. Uh, coming after Jonathan Cover is uh, certainly one. Uh, 
uh, big disadvantage. It's very hard to follow this presentation, uh, to, 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 uh, to give a presentation as good as his presentation. This is uh, or, uh, similar to that, I mean. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I, uh, I wasn't given the presentation or the lecture before. I was asked to uh, respond uh, spontaneously, and I think that's a test. Uh, to uh, my uh, a bit to, to the people who put the, you put them here for their ability to do so, and the third thing is that I don't know much about the Jerusalem project really, but in any case, uh, I would like to uh, uh, start with the issue of uh, cities as symbolic targets and uh, cities as symbols, relate that a little to Jerusalem, and then talk about the psychology of uh, nationalism and relate that to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and. Uh, 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 and Jerusalem in particular. Uh, I uh, should start by saying that uh, I represent my own personal view. I don't represent any groups or national uh, point of view. Um, and um, I, I think that's, uh, that's important to, to state. <clears throat> now, I think uh, the cities as symp symbolic targets is, is, is an interesting idea. Uh, I think that cities as symbols, as such, is a, is a, is a very interesting idea. And uh, for somebody who is coming uh, from that part of the world, I should also say that although I, I agree with uh, Jonathan on many of, I would have presented something similar in terms of the psychology of nationalism and what needs to be done in terms of historical narratives if I came from London. But because I'm coming from the third world originally, and because I'm coming also from a uh, powerless group in the Arab-Israeli conflict that is the uh, Palestinian group, uh, you will see that I, I, I will bring different views uh, and analysis on how, thing, on how this could be, uh, could be done. Uh, so uh, cities as, as symbols is, is a fascinating idea, and somebody who is coming from that part of the world would probably, even if he or she were to be a Palestinian, in a, uh, in a normal development of the region. Let's say normal development of the region would mean a struggle of the Arab nations. And I use struggle because it's the word that's used in the, in the third world. And I use nationalism. I don't ask the question how to mitigate nationalism or how to reduce nationalism. I think nationalism in a particular stage of people's, of nations' development is something to be sought, to be, uh, uh, to be encouraged, actually. Uh, so the, the struggle, uh, if, if, the, if the struggle of the Arab nations for liberation from the colonial projects altogether were to continue in a normal way, uh, I think that Jerusalem would have occupied a symbolic piece in Arab thinking and emotions. But I doubt how much that piece would be for secular Arab nationalists and secular Palestinian nationalists. I think Baghdad, for example, might have occupied a stronger place. Baghdad, as the, uh, as the cradle uh, of the golden Arab age, the cradle of civilization, the place where Arab science, philosophy, arts, literature, libraries, and so on developed, might have taken a, a, stronger, a, a stronger place, a stronger symbol. S -s certainly Damascus would have been another one, because Damascus is the secular capital of the Umayyad uh, uh, empire, Khalifat empire, that tried to unite the Arab world. It certainly Damascus plays on that role until now. Cairo, Beirut, Algiers as the symbol of struggle against colonialism and victory against colonialism. Uh, Fallujah at the present time I think might take a, a, a stronger peace in, in, in symbolism as a city uh, than uh, other, other cities. Jerusalem did take that, that particular symbol because, <laughs> because of the history of the conflict, because of the history of the conflict between the Palestinian national movement and Zionism. For Zionism, Jerusalem is Perhaps, well, let me put my words carefully here. For some streams of Zionism, Jerusalem is a source of moral legitimacy for the Zionist project. 
uh, I can't I can't forget the the words of a minister that I was trying to remember his name, but my friends here will, will remind me. He's the immigrant from Russia. He was Sharansky, thank you. Uh, Sharansky, who after uh, after Sharon, after Barack and Sharon after Barack Camp David, after Barack was willing to, to negotiate over the Western Wall was saying, well, if you give the Western Wall, what is the source of our legitimacy in this place, in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, in his language? So, so Jerusalem took that religious symbolism that is related to the political symbolism, that is related to the ideological uh, and moral justification of, of Zionism. And I think Palestinians tried to do the same. They went to uh, religious symbols, and it certainly Jerusalem was, was, was the capital of Palestine, but they also looked into similar religious symbols, and that was in Al-Aqsa and other religious, other religious places. And Al-Aqsa is a symbol, is certainly a symbol for Palestinians, but it's a symbol, it's a religious symbol. It's, it's, it's probably for seculars less important than, uh, than, than for religious. Those who are nationalist and sec secular among us were actually worried. Five days after the Second Intifada started, I had an op-ed in the Boston Globe uh, about Al-Aqsa Intifada and warning that this Intifada is going along religious tracks by calling it Al-Aqsa Intifada, by centering the Palestinian discourse around Al-Aqsa, and by having also the Israelis' uh, uh, discourse so much uh, uh, um, deep into uh, religious, uh, religious symbol. And if we, if we observe what's happening now, indeed, it seems that the conflict is uh, you know, the religious uh, factions are, are strong on each side, and the, the conflict might go into uh, religious, uh, religious paths. Uh, so, well, but can we think of a different Jerusalem? Can we think of the Jerusalem that you're thinking about, of the new Jerusalem in the third piece of your presentation, in the future of your presentation? Can we imagine a Jerusalem? Can we negotiate a new Jerusalem? Can we have that building and these narratives, these separate narratives and related narratives? Well, it's not easy. We know it's not easy because I think that in order to free our imagination, I would argue that we need to go to the historical narratives. Actually, by, perhaps by accident, tomorrow I have a talk with my graduate students at Fletcher uh, entitled something like, Who Needs History and the Place of Historical Narratives in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution, something of that sort. Can people whose conflict is not really uh, about narratives, but in which narratives is a central role, in which the narrative of one excludes the mere legitimacy and existence of the other. Put that aside and say, let's imagine the future. Can people who uh, have such a power imbalance in their relationship that one of them, that is the Palestinian group, feels so much injustice and so much exclusion and humiliation that can say, well, all right, let's leave that aside and go to the future. Can people whose historical truths are uh, mutually exclusive just say that, all right, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Your truth is as valid as mine. And let's look at it like the Western world in the last 50 or 60, 60 years of postmodernism, accepting the relativity of truth and the relativity of points of view and the validity of each side's point of view. Can people whose very existence, very existence in terms of their personal daily experience every day, both Israelis and certainly the Palestinians, is hinges upon what kind of truth is that.
I argue that it's very hard to do that, if impossible. My argument is that in order to do that, I think that history, we have to go back to, to narratives and deconstruct narratives. We have to think about these narratives and about the future in a way in which justice is a frame of reference. Justice is not a frame of reference in international negotiation, in international conflict resolution, in thinking about nationalism, in thinking about conflict. For the Islamic world, and for the third world, and for the powerless, justice is very important. And I think that we have to introduce the concept of justice when we try to imagine the future. The justice until justice of the future and looking also at the uh, issue of historical truth. Now, why is historical truth so important? Historical truth is important is precisely because, as uh, Jonathan Cover uh, 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 described, it's related to the national identity and cert certainly to the personal identity. I hope I'll have a little time to talk about that, uh, about that later. If, if a group is telling another group, like the Israelis are telling the Palestinians, you actually do not, this place is not yours. You are actually inhabitants of this place for how many years as you want. But this is the place of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. You kept it, you maintained it, that's fine. But this is the place of, and you didn't really exact, exist here as a national group. And if the Palestinians at the same time are telling the Israelis, as I think many of them are telling them, I, I think all Palestinians tell the Israelis the first part of what I'm going to say, the second part many Palestinians are saying, that the Zionist project has no legitimacy to start with. If you think that you are, getting, you are going to get from Palestinians a recognition that this is the, your homeland and that you have the original right to come here and build a nation for yourselves on our homeland, you are not going to get this from us. I think that by and large, Palestinians are saying that. However, we can recognize that you came here, you won, you established your state, and there is something called Israel that has the right to exist with its inhabitants citizens, all of them, not only the Israelis, to define its future. I find it fascinating that in the last sentence, when you talked about, you know, Palestinians and, and what? Jews? Israelis? This is very interesting. Is the conflict with Jews or is the conflict with Israelis? If it's the state of Israel for its citizens, then it's these citizens, these Israelis, Arabs and Jews, are to define the future. If it's a conflict with the Jews, then the, you know, the community councils, Jewish community councils in Boston and New York and elsewhere and all over the Jewish people will take part in defining that. So then the truth, therefore, is very important for those who, are, who feel the injustice and would be very important for them to build a future in which they can imagine a peaceful coexistence and useful coexistence, uh, but after the historical truth is being uh, 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 recognized and responsibility for what happened in, in Palestine also defined. Now, I find it here, I don't know what is the source of the insistence. I must, you know, be, to be completely open with you, I don't know if the source of the Palestinian insistence on historical truth and historical responsibility of, for example, asking Israel to recognize the right of return. Why is it asking Israel to recognize the right of return? It's to recognize the Palestinian narrative. It's to recognize the tragedy of the Palestinians. Perhaps the actual, the actual resolution of the Palestinian problem would be similar to what the Israelis and Palestinians will negotiate, the, the practical one. But the psychological one has to do with recognizing their narrative. Now, why do Palestinians insist on that? Is it because they are third world? 
Is it because this is something that, you know, that as some argue that the third world is not in the developmental stages, hasn't come up to the, uh, uh, you know, end of history and to postmodernism and so on? Or is it more related to being powerless and feeling oppressed and feel, feeling the injustice so much as part of their identity that they cannot even go ahead to imagine the future without that uh, being, uh, being recognized. So I'm not, I'm not actually sure. I tend to believe that it's more related to the particular Palestinian experience as a third world, uh, people who endured injustice uh, and uh, uh, dispersion. Uh, let me take uh, uh, just uh, two, two, or three, uh, two or three more points. Perhaps I should take the issue of nationalism before going to the psychological uh, experiments and the psychological components of, you know, the question of the division of we versus us versus them, that psychological division that you talked about well. Uh, you mentioned the, the fascinating experiment by Zimbardo at Stanford with the, with the psychology department basement where he divided people into guards and prisoners and the minute he divided them, actually randomly, they played the role. There is a lot of criticism on that, uh, uh, on that experiment that people were acting out their stereotypes rather than being really actual guards and, and prisoners. They, are, they were acting out what they know about how prisoners behave. Let's suppose that that's, although uh, the validity, the external validity of this experiment. There's also the experiment uh, by uh, Milgram at Yale, uh, when, when he puts people in situation where an authority asks them to, 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 to uh, obey, this, to obey authority, to hurt other people, Fantastically, 63% of the population of, this, of, of, of his sample who were not students were people actually from uh, uh, around Yale, uh, a, a, random, a sample from adults, agreed to hurt, uh, to, to deliver an electric shock to other people on the orders of an experiment, of an experimenter to 450 volts. No volts were, 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 were delivered, but they thought that they were doing that. And there's the, ex the uh, experiment by Tajfil from, uh, from Britain who divided people just randomly at the flip of a coin and then they developed this feeling of us versus them and developed in group favoritism and so on. Now what does this tell us? What I read in this is actually as a social psychologist in discipline is the power of the situation basically. What, that's, what this tells me is that when I put people in a situation in which the situation itself has its own powerful requirements, people are inclined to go with the situation actually a little more than they are inclined to go with their personal tendencies. Even if I'm a very nice person who doesn't hurt anybody else, if I'm put in that situation of obedience, the situation forces me sometimes to, to do that. So I think in, in thinking about conflict resolution, we should also, or in thinking about the future, I think we should also think about that. We should think about changing the circumstances. I think Jerusalem as is now, as is now, with all the power of imagination, the imagination is fine, but Jerusalem as constructed now, with a group, one group dominating another group completely, defining, de designing where they live, whether they get a permit or not get a permit, actually not getting a permit, whether they leave the town or not leave the town, where they don't have citizenship, where the conditions for getting citizenship are, are so severe, and so on and so on, where their land is taken, where the city is considered to be Jewish when it's binational, and so on. I think these, we have to put some imagination in also changing the, the situation itself, the circumstances, the constellation of power relations be, between the group, not only, uh, uh, and then therefore, uh, you know, the issue about um, um, 
that the tribalism, you want me to finish now? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll make two more, I'll make two more points, okay, that, that's fine, I'll make two more points and, and end with that. The thing about the uh, us versus them and tribalism, that is, that's probably right. Walker Connor, one of the people who, who studied uh, ethnic conflict and ethno-nationalism for a long time, uh, argued the strong psychological bonds and the strong psychological components of tribalism. Well, I don't have time to develop. I think he was mistaken in a way. Why? Because the issue, the imagined communities that you talked about will have also to, to depend on us where do we attribute and put our emotional attachments. I don't have to put my emotional attachment with my nation. I don't have to put my emotional atta attachment with my religious group. But what's happening is that the conflict circumstances are pushing people to do that. Perhaps there is, it's easier to put the emotional attachment in terms of identity with territory, with ethnic group, with religious group. Perhaps that's true. But we also should know that we have the power to reorganize, to engineer the social forces so that our attachment can be civic. Why can Americans have civic identity and civic affiliation? And we cannot think, for example, in changing Israel into a place where civic identity is much more important than national identity. Well, one, one simple recommendation to do that is to have equality. One simple uh, recommendation is to do like the American Constitution. It's not as easy as that, I know. So we have to think of these, of these directions. The last point is about nationalism and, you know, medicating nationalism that I started to talk about. Again, if, I, if I'm coming from the end of history, if I'm coming as American, as European, if I'm coming as somebody with that the generations of conflict are over, if I'm coming with somebody where the standard of living for the Western world, the Western world has achieved it, has made it in terms of standard of living, in terms of scientific achievement, in terms of arts and leisure and science and so on, then who needs nationalism? Then in Europe, I can go after the nation state has been established for so long, after the internal violence in the nation state has been there for hundreds of years. Yes, then I can think about mitigating nationalism. But if my country is taken, I'm now th th thinking the third world, right? Not necessarily the Palestinian. If the Western world is coming and invading me, if the col colonialist project started, stopped, and restarted, I think that nationalism has a positive force to play. And that nationalism that should play a positive role without being chauvinistic is the challenge of people who are coming from areas like myself. Thank you. I want to apologize for not being clear about the time, timing here, because clearly we never, every week we go over and over, and in theory we're supposed to end at seven, but we want to have at least time for maybe 20 minutes of questions and, and comments. And I do want to, I, normally I would give Jonathan an opportunity response, but I, I, I think, I talk I, think too some, no, I think there's some points, both of, uh, agreement and disagreement in what you both said, but maybe we will start by turning it over, over to the audience for questions, and I'm sure that in the, in the context of those questions, some of these things will come up. So, Emma? Uh, there's so many uh, in interesting points. I really agree with uh, almost everything. Uh, I agree, uh, especially with what, what you said, and, most, and much of what you said, too. Uh, but it seems to me that there are one of the mo most important facts about ethnic conflict is its hair-trigger onset, that it is so easily, it, 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 it's eruption. It's not, you know, yes, there are, tri you know, there are tribal narratives that are, that are very stable over a long time, but they don't, necessarily, they, don't, they don't necessarily erupt. And the question is, when does the balance shift? So uh, one, of, one very interesting uh, point 
if to look at is in the U.S., which is not a, a, a country that has been oppressed and has been and is powerless. Quite the contrary, uh, you spoke about 9/11 and the extraordinary sense of solidarity that prevailed for a few weeks, and not just solidarity of us versus them, but a solidarity. Uh, there was a sense of we need to understand why people would be would be pushed to do this and it and it disappeared almost like that it was turned into the most vicious kind of of, of nationalism uh, that you would of the kind, just the kind you would expect from a, a, a for a pe from a people that was totally powerless uh, it's that churn i think that is so, I think that every example that you gave of a solution is always conditional. It's there. Are, it's it's so the, the, the dynamics are so unstable. Separ separating, uh, institutionalizing separation between uh, conflicting groups works sometimes, and sometimes it, it goes the other way. It backfires, as in Partition of India. Uh, uh, dissolving separation sometimes it works and sometimes it is explosive in itself because it denies people's identity. So there, it's the specificity of ethnic conflict seems to me so apt, so apt, so incredibly important. And, and one other point that I, that wasn't mentioned is the uh, you know the, what Freud called the narcissism of small differences. All the worst ethnic conflicts are erupting around very small differences. So, uh, just you want to? Please. Yeah. Uh, well, I absolutely agree about the hair trigger, hair trigger volatility of these situations. I, I think one of the problems is that peace is a rather long, slow thing to make, and if some small group on one side does something which seems to be a direct attack or humiliation for the other side, then all the old narratives, all the old hostilities are kind of there latent waiting to bubble up. I was very interested in what you said about 9-11, uh, because 9-11 seems to me a very striking example of the bent twig, of, the, of humiliation and in, in a sense defeat, because although obviously the United States is the superpower in the world, it is the powerful country, it was a tremendous shock, clearly. It was the first time that anything, and so dramatic, I mean the genius for publicity and theater of the people who designed it, made sure that it was a very, very powerful shock and humiliation. So for a very short time, I thought maybe the United States is going to be the only country that would manage to absorb this without the aggressive nationalist response. Uh, but alas, it wasn't to be, as you, as, you, as you say. But I do agree that there is this hair trigger thing. But I don't think it was inevitable. I think it was, I mean, you know, I don't think it, uh, it was manipulated. Or yeah. there is very strong interest that put, it's easily pushed at that at that unstable point, and there. Are, uh, well, can I ask you a question? I mean, what, suppose there had been a different administration in power here. Supposing there had been an administration uh, led by, I'll take a American politician from the past. Supposing Adlai Stevenson had been president when something like this had happened. Would he have been able to carry the country with, a, as it were, a pacific, benevolent response, saying, we have to understand, we've got to understand that the people who did this see that the United States has felt free to bomb our countries all over the Middle East whenever we've stepped out of line with what they want. We've got to understand, we've got to take this. My feeling is that even if some wonderful leader had had the vision and generosity to say that, that the United States, like other countries, would contain a lot of people who would have felt this was a soft liberal response that wasn't adequate to the occasion. Am I wrong? I hope uh, I am. I, well, you know, we can speculate. Uh, I don't think it's either or. I think, uh, uh, and nor do I think that 
the immediate response was one of, of humiliation, shock for, for certain. But I think you, this, the, the narrative of humiliation was constructed. I think that a, another response would have been possible that would have both uh, would have both uh, contained both the uh, articulated the need to protect for, for protection and for an, an anti-terrorism program and a need to understand what I don't think they, those were in conflict in principle. Do you want to respond? And we have some other questions. Well, you know, one, one of the fascinating things in, in uh, conflict studies is this, what you call the, you know, the turning point. The turning point, right. we don't know when that, uh, uh, when that happens, but I think that uh, there was, as, as, you, as you mentioned, there was a, a period of time where people were asking questions and could, okay. could, have, could, have, gone, uh, could have gone either way. Uh, it's... Uh, I mean, I agree that in a different administration it could have gone the, 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 the different way, but it seems that in that discussion with the political interests and with, with the ignorance about the Arab world and the Islamic world, I think it was easy to exploit that with the political interests and take it and, and make a political program out of it and get to the mess that we are into these days. I have a, a question. First of all, thank you for the both presentations. I think they, they, are, they are very, very pointed. And I, what I have in mind is a um, historical fact that I wanted to just both of you to reflect on, particularly during India's independence struggle and the role of Gandhi played. Knowing fully well that Gandhi was in a situation of powerlessness of the, the British uh, colonial power, nevertheless, the way he imagined what does it mean to give a response. I think it's important for us to think of that as an example when we try to connect the dot between identity, nationalism, and conflict that automatically sort of flows in our mind as, as, without connecting them in a linear way that they have to. That I think in a way he was proposing a different imagination. Not that he was not acknowledging that there is power differences. I mean, he was very aware of power differences, yet so somehow he appealed to national identity at the same time. So it was not that automatically national identity leads to conflict. He appealed to the powerlessness, he appealed to national identity, and yet he didn't appeal to conflict and violence. So they don't go together necessarily always. And I think this moral imagination that we are trying to struggle with is to make a different kind of connection. Well, uh, can, can I, anyway, link that with the response to, to, to my talk, um, it seems to me that I mean I absolutely agree with what you said that justice is a very important dimension in thinking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And I didn't mention everything in my talk, but I actually and I totally agree that an account which leaves out the gross disparities between the two groups obviously has something hugely missing. I, I accept that, but I suppose the Gandhi case is interesting because it, I would have thought that British colonial rule in India contained a huge amount of injustice. And yet Gandhi was able to wage a peaceful campaign. And I suppose there's a question about whether this doesn't raise a question about whether it's right to say that, as you said towards the end, the situation, everything's essentially a product of the situation. Um, because the situations, although there are obvious differences between colonial India and Palestine, Israel. Um, there's still the same kind of injustice, I would have thought. So what, what is the explanation of the way in which we've got the spiral of violence in the Middle East, but somehow, although there was terrible bloodshed with the partition in India, uh, there wasn't, uh, the Gandhi somehow managed to run a pacifist nationalist campaign. You're asking me? Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is one of the toughest questions that that we have. Uh, I mean, why is it? Uh, I I hear. I I mean, I do not. Th there 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 was some debate within the Palestinian community uh, about following nonviolent uh, routes, and they were actually attempted to do that. And uh, after the first Intifada, during the first Intifada, some people even argue that the first Intifada, in which 
no weapon, no 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 uh, firearms were used by the Palestinians. It, but no firearms were used. It's not because well we don't know why they didn't have firearms, so they didn't use firearms. We don't know if they because they didn't want it or because they they didn't have it. Uh, uh, I you know uh, it's. Uh, the, 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 Palestinian, the, the Palestinian resistance came at a time of the 50s and 60s in which other types of resistance used armed struggle. And uh, the Palestinian resistance outside Palestine started as such. The PLO started as such. It was part of the third world, major third world movements of doing so. Uh, the question is whether India was the rule or was the exception. India seems to, to be more the exception than the rule. Now, why is India different? I, I wouldn't ask the question why the Palestinians are different from India. I would ask the question why is India different from all other countries in the third world? And this is a fascinating question. I don't have the answer to that. Uh, but, but, but framing the question that way, I think, might be, might be. It's not, I mean, one can say it into fall into the stereotypic thinking of Islamic culture and violence in Islam and suicide in Islam and so on. But the zeitgeist of the, the 60s, when the, when the Palestinian movement started, the PLO started, was part of the African armed struggle and third world and Asian and so on armed struggle. So it's not an aberration. The aberration is, is, is the nonviolent in a way. And it's a, I, I agree with you that one has to think why and perhaps use it and learn from it and uh, uh, imagine how, how that could be done. We have two more questions, I think, since we're being at 715. Uh, Tom and then Nomi. Um, sorry for sorry, this woman left. Uh, it seemed to me that for a few days after 9-11, there was a period of recollection and reflection in this country. And um, maybe even people talked about the root causes, what was behind. I don't remember if there was stuff written about it, but certainly that was going around. And then a group, a group in power declared permanent war. I mean, it's really permanent. Uh, it's a permanent state of war. Um, that's a comment. Uh, I, I found a similarity between uh, Dr. Glover's remarks about the movies, which is a very clever idea, I think, and, uh, and you're uh, asking for some kind of a document or historical history of conflict. Uh, I would, I would also pose, uh, I wonder what you think about the idea of uh, forgiveness, transcendent uh, action between states. People have written about it. There has been forgiveness between various states. Uh, maybe uh, Germany, maybe the Jews will never forget, forgive Germany, but um, Germany certain, certainly made uh, efforts to to get forgiveness and to and to help the state of Israel, and uh, I wonder what you think about some sort of a transcendental uh, uh, in, impetus to get out of this business of the nation state versus the nation state or ethnic group versus ethnic group. Just throw it up. I, I think, if you don't mind, I'd like to. We have two more questions. Let's group the questions because. At the, I'm sorry sure. to like, you know, hit That's the integrity of any anyway. individual question, but I have a feeling maybe we will, otherwise I have a feeling we might go on a little. So let's just say, Naomi, can you ask a question and also the Thank gentleman you. quickly, and then we'll let you guys respond to both the forgiveness issue and the others. Uh, uh, first of all, just, just a historical comment. 80% uh, of Africa was liberated without any struggle. So one has to uh, review one's analysis of decolonization, at least in Africa. I won't talk about other places, because I don't know them well enough. Two separate questions. Um, following on, on the notion of the sort of line between solidarity and nationalism that we heard in the previous question, or even your statement, which immediately raised the question right at the beginning of your talk, uh, that um, 
the city was a, a place of national refuge and then became a place of a target. How does one make these distinctions? Where is the line? How do you draw it? What is that trigger, that elusive trigger, that that takes solidarity into nationalistic places or makes a refuge into a target? Even though both a refuge and a target have a very strong nationalist base, but it's played out very differently. So that's the question that intrigues me from your presentation. And to Nadim, I, I have to ask the question. You emphasize justice throughout your remarks, and um, but you also emphasize in funny ways, from what I heard, both the national identity and an issue issues of civil rights and human rights. Now, how would you find? Uh, could you give in? I know it's a difficult question. In two sentences or three sentences, some vision of a just solution in Jerusalem? How does it mix the nationalist element and the human rights elements that are so important to your analysis? Can't the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Following up on that one. Um, and maybe there's actually something in my, in my question that ties some of these together. And the word culture has been employed a lot in this conversation, but I think there's kind of a as often, I think, a level of ambiguity about that word that I think actually goes to the root of, at least to some degree, this conflict. And I'm wondering if when we use words like justice and use words like culture, and we understand that culture is constantly being recreated, um, if this is both a window into um, change and also a um, window into understanding conflict in, in a way that um, just, just thinking that that word can be used to narrow down some of these, some some issues that say would relate to, um, well, there's uh, culture in the in the, the realm of nationalism, but there's also culture in the realm of urbanism and city city culture, and so we can sort of look at concentric rings of culture, and we look at a figure like Gandhi, and how he actually both employed existing cultural infrastructure, but also recreated culture in his actions, so that his actions became um, the actions of a teacher. It wasn't simply, an, he wasn't simply an actor acting in a sort of incisive way in the problem, rather spreading something so that his ways became acted out by others. And we look at the word justice and say, okay, is it possible that there is injustice embedded in culture and that, that, that we actually have to look reflectively at cultural tendencies? I think we can look at the 9-11 Response, and we can we can do a cultural sort of archaeology of that, and we can look into cultures that exist to perpetuate conflict and say, is it possible that these conflicts are being absolutely at the very root level perpetuated every day at the level of the family, which is maybe the smallest cultural unit, um, and that maybe this is one of the successes that Gandhi was able to have is bringing solution in right into the very into the home. Um, I think that's such an important kind of process and maybe a cleansing process that also answers the question of forgiveness. Is it possible that forgiveness can exist as a cultural phenomenon that has to be cultivated? Culture is a cultivation of something. It's not just a kind of thing that's out there hanging that we have to just either embrace or, or reject, but it can be regrown constantly. Now I'm going to sigh for both of you because you both, you have to respond to these three incredible questions in ten, less than ten minutes, both of you. So, but I'll turn it to you to have we'll final this. comments about we'll these the final word. questions. I'll, that, I'll give that in short, and then you will have the final word. I think that would make, it make sense as the speaker. Uh, uh, the question about about forgiveness, I think, is a very uh, is a very important question and interesting question, and uh, it it really does relate to the whole issue of imagining the future and thinking about reconciliation. Uh, forgiveness became important in the last 10 or 15 years in the international diplomacy and, and the relationship between states and so on in light uh, of the emergence of the importance of truth and reconciliation commissions. We have to notice that truth and reconciliation commissions and committees 
started actually in the third world. They started in Africa, they mostly in Latin America, and um, there was some attempt to do something about history in Bosnia, but, but basically this is an experience that came from the, uh, uh, the third world. And I think once it came here to, this, to, the, to the Western world, it was kind of redefined and given an element of forgiveness. Uh, in many cases, forgiveness was not, was not the issue. The issue was going back to history and it, its truth and reconciliation and, and, working about, and, and working out the truth and having agreed upon truth and, and uh, responsibility and so on. Certainly that was the case in Chile, Argentina, uh, Uruguay and so on. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure forgiveness, I personally don't think forgiveness is needed. I, I don't think that the Jews should forgive the Nazis. I, I, and I don't blame them if they don't, but I think they can develop normal working relationships with the German. I think if history is, is, is recognized and truth is recognized, people can go ahead and have normal, good, healthy relationships without the necessity of, of forgiveness. Perhaps we can leave forgiveness to the level of individual work with individuals and uh, you know therapy with individuals and uh, people who were abused and hurt and so on on the national level i don't i think that the political message doesn't necessarily uh, re, uh, depend on, on forgiveness now in terms of justice um, Nomi, um <clears throat> and i don't see any conflict whatsoever between national identity and civil rights. I think, I think uh, the way I think of the... My vision. Yes, I'll tell you about my vision. Uh, but I think that national identity is a tool for me to work with my, you know, for people, to work with their communities to achieve civil rights, for example. There's no inherent contradiction between the two. There are a number of just solutions and visions for Jerusalem. One of them, if one way, if we disagree on defining justice, which relates to culture, perhaps, and so on, we can fall back onto the international law. We have clear-cut indications from the international law of what justice is. I'm willing to accept that as justice. And, and, and for one, to accept that as a way of dealing with the issue. So if the international law tells me two states in which Palestinians live in one state and the Israeli citizens live in one state and there are two, two uh, uh, this, what, this is what they want, uh, two capitals, that's fine. If they want one capital for both of them, that's fine too. There is more than one way to envision it. But uh, you, you know, one unified capital for the two states is possible and two separate uh, 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 states along line, the uh, 1967 borders or something similar to that, that's also uh, just. It's clear that it's not just to have Jerusalem go all the way down to Jericho. That's not just. So we, at least we can agree on what is not, you know, the, the, the Sharon plan with uh, Bush approval or something of that sort. So there are n a number of, number of visions. And if we disagree, the international law is a great way to um, uh, mediate or to arbitrate our disagreement. Um, I find that I agree again a great deal with what Nadim has said, um, with, a lot, with a lot of it. And so I wonder if, given that there's very great time pressure, would it be outrageous if I piggybacked on his answers to the last two questions and simply concentrate on the forgiveness issue? I hope this isn't an outrageous cheat or an insult to either of the interesting questions that you both asked behind. But if I could just, I, I'm intrigued by the issue of forgiveness. And I think it is a very interesting, difficult issue. Um, I think that the idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a very good one. I don't think there can be forgiveness unless fault is admitted by the person who is to be forgiven. So that it seems to me that part of what's been going on in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission is although there have been some evasions, there's been a, a serious attempt by people who ran the old apartheid regime to say, yes, we're sorry. When people say that, it makes things much easier for the whole, the air is cleared in that way. And 
I think you don't have to have forgiveness. I agree with what Nadim said about you don't have to have forgiveness for normal relations. But I think it's a hugely valuable contribution because it gets rid of the feeling that you're still dealing with people who fundamentally have the attitudes which were so terrible before. I mean, I think there's a huge difference. Um, Germany was mentioned. Uh, Germany has uh, done a huge amount, I mean, not at first after the Second World War, but in the time since about the 1960s, there has been an enormous amount of effort. Let's not deny the, 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 the Nazi genocide. Let's talk about it. Let's see how it happened. Let, and you know, Most of the people in Germany now were either children or not born when that happened. But still, they accept a kind of responsibility because it's their culture. And they want to make it clear that you know, we'd, our, our culture wasn't us personally, but our culture did this. And we wish it hadn't happened. And that makes a tremendous difference. Now, I think that makes a great I was recently in Austria where much less of this has happened. And it seemed to me that if I were Jewish, which I'm not, it would be much harder to feel forgiveness towards Austrians who kept saying, well, of course, we were the first victims of Nazism. Uh, we, weren't, we weren't the perpetrators, we were the victims. I mean, hell, Hitler was an Austrian. Many of the other Nazi leaders were Austrians. We've all seen the films of the cheering crowds of Austrians at the time of the Anschluss. Um, I mean, it's nonsense they were the first victims, but because they go on denying their role, not all Austrians, I don't want to stereotype any group, but because many Austrians go on denying their role, um, it must be harder for Jews to forgive them. Now, the, turning just briefly on forgiveness to the Israel-Palestine issue, I want to just mention two episodes which happened in rapid succession about three years ago. You may remember them because the pictures went round the world of both of them. The first one, there was a little boy, aged about nine, a Palestinian boy, crouching behind his father to try to avoid the, the bullets of the Israeli soldiers who were shooting at them. He failed and he died. Um, a couple of weeks later, I think it was two young Israeli men, I can't remember if they were soldiers or civilians, I think they were soldiers but I may be wrong about this, strayed over the frontier into some Palestinian controlled territory and were taken into a building and they died by being literally torn apart by a hostile crowd. Now when we outside the conflict see that our first feeling is of the horror and the tragedy of those episodes. But to me, they have an extra dimension of tragedy because they contribute to the narratives. We can all see how easy it is for the Palestinians to say, we can't make peace with them. They deliberately target our children. And we can all see how easy it is for the Israelis to say, we can't make peace with them. They're savages who tore our, our young men to bits. Now, it seems to me that while you can have tolerable relationships if peace is made after a long history of episodes of this sort. If we're to weaken the powerful, horrifying grip of these narratives, where the other side are always evil and it's so hard to get on with them, it would help if we get to the point where each side says, we wish the thing that our side did hadn't been done. We're sorry it happened. It's very hard to do it. Now, and one of the things which I thought came out very powerfully in Nadim's talk is that um, you can't just change all the psychology of nationalism without changing the situation and without thinking about justice. But if you're trapped in the psychology of nationalism, it may be hard to bring about justice too. And so it's very hard to know where we should start. I finish on a rather pessimistic note, and I apologize for again running slightly over time. <laughs>